Uh, today, I am going to be talking, uh, giving some perspectives on basically youth and overseas projects. So, looking at school trips, at school exchanges, and also at OCIP. Now, being an academic, I'm not going to just um, sort of stand up and say, you know, do rah rah and say these are all, all very wonderful things. They are very good things. But I want to um, raise a few questions to, for you all, because you may still be going on some trips, and also just to think more broadly about how do we really make these things meaningful. Um, if we are really going to use these kinds of trips for secondary school students, for JC students, uh, for poly students, to, and ITV students to go and build bridges, how can they do that more effectively? What are the benefits and pluses of these kinds of trips? Certainly, I think probably number one, and if we are especially if we're thinking about building bridges, is that they really help to build what we can call real-time knowledge about other countries in the region. And you get to go and you get a much different perspective from, let's say, if you go with your family and it's just shopping in Makan for the whole time, right? Now, you would, when you go on a school trip, it's shopping in Makan, but also some organized activities. So that you do get some real significant knowledge about the place that you're going. It's also very good to be able to go and go to these other countries and then look back at Singapore and reflect, understand yourself more. As someone who has lived, I've lived in five different foreign countries and I've spent probably close to half my life living overseas, it definitely helps me to have a very good perspective on my own country, on the States. And so when you have been somewhere else and you can go back and look comparatively, and that doesn't mean just thinking, oh, you know, we, we are so comfortable in Singapore, you know, everything is so, so nice here, it works so well. Generally speaking, those are true. But it is also to hopefully to help you to think um, a little bit more critically and to really make some um, in important comparative observations with your own society and culture. And if from a Singaporean point of view, it is a good source of soft power. Singapore already, is, of course, is quite generally quite well known among the different Southeast Asian countries. Uh, in Vietnam, where I lived and where I used to teach, um, Singapore generally has a, has a very, very good reputation. And soft power, as you probably know, are different ways for a country to project its culture and to project its influence through different kinds of contacts and education. And I think this is that school trips provide a very good, important, uh, very important chance for uh, students from Singapore to go and do that, essentially to project Singapore's soft power in the region and further beyond. OCIP particularly, uh, I think that, uh, and I will raise a couple of questions about OCIP later on, but essentially to go and spend a few days digging wells, or building toilets, or teaching a bit of English, these are good things. And there are, it's good just to get out, to be in a completely different environment, to see how people in a, in a different context live, and to hopefully do make a bit of change in their lives just by being there. That, I think, is probably the number one benefit of OCIP. But I want to raise some concerns or reflections, things to think about when students set out on these trips and uh, or when the trips are being planned. Uh, a number of these observations are from things that I have seen over the years. When I talk to students who are coming into NUS, uh, I'm attached to uh, one of the residential colleges there, at College of Alice Peter Khan, where many, many students have come in and have done uh, OCIP. And I, uh, because a number of my former students from the history department are teachers, so I've heard quite a lot of stories about school trips and projects of various kinds. And I've gained, I think, a lot of sort of secondhand experience in those things uh, from the different people that I have talked to. The most important question, I think, and I think every teacher will agree with this, is how do we keep from turning these kinds of trips into just school tourism? How do you make sure, particularly if it is, let's say, just a school exchange, if you're not going to be out in the kampong, uh, you know, digging, uh, digging wells or building toilets, 
how do you keep it from being more than just going and shopping in Makkah and, and visiting a few schools? This is really the key thing to make sure that they are meaningful experiences. How to make sure that there is real learning going on? And I'm sure the teachers particularly struggle with this because they have the KPI, right? You have to come back, be able to come back and show the school that the money in this script was well, was well invested uh, to begin with and <coughs> that your students did not just waste their time. So it's very key for learning to make sure that there is real learning going on. One of the important questions, I think, is to look very carefully at who is your local partner on the other end. You want to make sure, it's important for schools to make sure that their partners on the ground in the other country are really providing help and knowledge and not just logistics. A couple of years ago, one of my former students uh, took a, was on a school trip to Vietnam. And this was a neighborhood school with quite a lot of Muslim kids. And they were sighted in the Vietnamese city in a hotel opposite a slaughterhouse for pigs. Now that does not show a great degree of cultural sensitivity. And that suggests that the partner in Vietnam really had no idea what to do with these kids. So this, I think it's important for schools when we are arranging these trips to make sure that these are partners that really get Singapore kids and also get the needs they have and also are going to make sure that on the other side these trips are really going to be meaningful and really going to be learning experiences. I think it's also important to think about just how much historical and cultural information is provided before the trip. Very often, I have a strong sense that kids are being sent off with very, very little knowledge about the country that they're going to. A couple of times, I have been actually asked by schools, by my former students who were teachers, to, particularly if they were going to Vietnam, to my main specialization, they would ask me to come and give a talk, kind of briefing in advance. I even have a, I, have, I also do a demonstration of how to cross traffic city traffic in Vietnam, how to cross the street with traffic, because it's a very, very careful skill that you require. But the schools that do this are very small minorities. And sometimes I have, when I have talked to former students who said, yeah, Prof, you know, we're going on a school trip to Vietnam. I said, oh, you want me to come and give some briefing? Oh, sorry, Prof, no time. It's just too cool. Okay, I, I think generally speaking, having some kind of real historical and cultural briefing, uh, you want to make sure that your students really know where they're going, and, and it's important for you all, if you're going on trips, to really do some research in advance. We can build much more effective bridges if we are informed. Okay? If, we really, if we're really going to build a bridge, we have to know who's on the other side, and the more we know about them, the more effectively that we, we can build a bridge with that. And I think this is very important. A couple of uh, concerns specifically for the OCIP. Is the project really useful and sustainable? I have had a number of students, uh, when I was doing freshman interviews at CAPT in the US, they'd say, you know, yeah, we went over there, and we did this project, but I'm not sure how useful it was. Okay, we went there for four days, and we taught them English for four days. But what were they going to do after that? Now, there are many kinds of OCIP, and sometimes you may well be stuck with whatever you are assigned to go for. But I think more broadly, when schools are thinking about OCIP, it is important to think about something that is going to be sustainable that's not going to be a kind of one-off thing where the Singaporean students just sort of parachute in for a few days and then go off and then there is nothing else really after that. This is very, this is almost like uh, what is now sometimes called development tourism. That essentially you come in, you just do a couple of things and then you will stop afterwards and there is not much of a legacy afterwards. Second question is, are students able to understand rural society 
across and beyond rural poverty. A lot of those CIP are, of course, out in the Commonwealth. And sometimes I have the impression that when the kids come back, their main takeaway is a lot. They're very poor. That that is really the main impression that they have. And yes, they probably are poor. But there is also an entire rhythm of rural society. Uh, before I went to Vietnam, I spent three years in Laos. And I often went to different villages. And yes, their standard of living is quite low. But they, generally speaking, um, still maintain an overall you know, integrity in their lives. So I think it's important for students to have some understanding, especially because you know, we don't have any problem in Singapore anymore. They've all been replaced by HGB, as uh, Ms. Yao was saying earlier. So if you go to a compound, help try to understand this is not just a bunch of poor people, but there is an agricultural life, there is a rhythm out there that people follow, and that this is really part of their lives that we need to understand when we go there. One other point, which I, I didn't put in here, but really goes to the previous slide about knowing who you are, knowing where you are. Sometimes when I talk to students who went to Vietnam or Thailand, for example, I'll say, okay, so where did you go? Uh, the mountains. Okay. Uh, which province? Uh, uh, got some tribe, some hill tribe. I said, oh, hill tribe, okay. Which ethnic group? Oh, don't know So they were somewhere, okay, and but they didn't really know which which province it was, which ethnic group it was. This is kind of ignorant. So when you go somewhere, you want to know about these people, right? You want to know, try to know who they are, and to be able to really come back and have a takeaway and say that I learned something about this group. Again, that is how bridges are built more effectively. So. Finally, the real question for me for OCIP is, are they challenged to think about going back and do more? Now, <clears throat> I think we see this a lot. A lot of churches, including my own church, uh, we do a lot of missions projects. So I think many, many students that go overseas on church mission projects, there is continuity built into that, and they're more likely to come back. OCIP, I think it's also good if students can think about this. We don't want OCIP to be just ticking off a box on a list of things that students are expected to do. If students are really going to do something meaningful on this kind of project, then they will, um, they will have a more takeaway, they will have a more valuable time, and they will really have a longer lasting contribution. So, in conclusion, if we're really going to think about building bridges to other countries in the region or elsewhere, I think it's important to have those bridges built on solid ground. We want to make sure that we know as much as possible, that when we go, we are doing useful things, and that we come, when we come back, we have a real sense of where we have been and what we have done and whom we have done those things for. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Long.